Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to today's uh, autumn service. It's a nice warm day in autumn, and uh, we're glad to have this nice weather. But today for our baptismal service, I'd like to welcome uh, particularly the family and friends of uh, Antimo and Lisa, who are here today for their baptism. And after the service, there's a cup of tea in the hall, <clears throat> and visitors can just follow the people round um, the church to the hall. Children and young people will go out to Sunday school after their hymn following the baptism. And just a reminder that tonight, Nathan will be le leading the Church at Five service here in the church. Thank you. Satisfy us at daybreak with your love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. The goodness of God beckons, calling us to goodness and grace. The grace of God redeems, saving us and making us whole. The love of God welcomes inviting us to worship and praise. Come, let us worship God.
loving God, you are the God of goodness and grace. As we worship you on this fourth Sunday in Lent, we ask that you will draw us close to you. Gather us as people of your goodness and grace. Gather us in worship and prayer that we may be strengthened with faith and courage. Gather us as those who are eager to live and to share your goodness and grace. Loving God, we confess that we have not worshipped you as we should, or served you as you desire, or obeyed you as you command. We have created you in our own image, forsaking you for our own interests, losing sight of your kingdom. We have not loved you with all our heart and soul and mind. We have not loved our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Yet, you still love us. Merciful God, forgive us, cleanse us, restore, and renew us. Assure us once more of your forgiveness, for we are truly sorry. Send us out in newness of life to live and to do good works to your glory. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. God didn't come into this world to point the finger and shout. God didn't come with a mission to crush us with our own feelings. God came to meet us in the rubble of our lives. So, Let God be God and receive the forgiving, reconciling love that God has for you. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We are now going to share in two adult baptisms. Sometimes we have one, but today I'm glad to report that we have double that, namely two. So I welcome Antimo and Lisa to St. Andrews today. Not that they really need any great welcome because they have been part of our fellowship now for a number of months and have been very much part of our church family. But nevertheless, in the context of this service today, I extend to you a very warm welcome and some members of your family as well. You are particularly welcome, and we trust that you enjoy your visit to St. Andrews today. Now, normally it is my practice when we have a baptism uh, to have a short talk to the parents, if it's an infant baptism, or to the individual or a couple as it is today, uh, before the baptism takes place. I'm going to depart from my normal uh, practice because I'm going to delay what I have to say to Antimo and Lisa until later in the service during the, the, the sermon. I will be applying some of our thoughts there to them in particular. Uh, so I'm going to pass over that at this stage and we'll come back to it later. <clears throat> now, Antimo and Lisa 
will soon be back here in church for another purpose. They're going to get married. I think we should give them a round of applause for that, don't you? So I look forward very much to uh, sharing in that very special occasion with them uh, later this year. <clears throat> Baptism is a sacrament ordained by Jesus Christ to be to us a sign and seal of our engrafting into Him, of remission of sins and regeneration by His Spirit, of reception into the church of God and resurrection unto eternal life, and of our response unto God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life. In accordance with God's purpose revealed in His covenant, Antimo and Lisa now present themselves for baptism on profession of their faith. I'm now going to invite Antimo and Lisa to the front, please. For as much as you, Antimo and Lisa, desire to receive this holy sacrament, it is necessary and right that you should make profession of your faith before God and this congregation, and declare openly that you are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Antimo and Lisa, do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried? He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge those who are alive and have buried. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Do you promise to make diligent use of the means of grace, to live in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, and to be a faithful member of the church of Christ? Let us pray. O God, send Your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this water that Antimo and Lisa, being buried with Christ in baptism, may rise with Him to newness of life, and being born anew of water and the Holy Spirit, may remain forever in the number of Your faithful children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Will the congregation please stand? Antimo and Lisa, for you, Jesus Christ, came into the world. For you, He lived and showed God's love. For you, He suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried at the last, it is accomplished. For you, He triumphed over death and rose in newness of life. 
for you he ascended to reign at God's right hand. All this he did for each of you before you knew anything of it. And so the word of Scripture is fulfilled. We love because God loved us first. Antimo and Lisa, will you please kneel? see, it is different today. David and I did rehearse this, but he's forgotten his lines. I need the towel, Dave. Antimo Barry Coates, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lisa Smith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and dwell in your hearts forever. We sing the ironic blessing. Antimo and Lisa, will you please stand? Antimo and Lisa are now baptized into Jesus Christ. We receive and welcome them as members of the one holy, universal, and apostolic church. I welcome into the life of this congregation. Congratulations, and we look forward to sharing fellowship with you for a long time to come. Now, you as a congregation also have a very important part to play. You who are gathered here represent the whole church throughout the world. Word and sacrament bring you the joy of Christ's presence in your midst. They also bring you responsibilities as Christ's people in this place. Do you welcome Antimo, Coates, and Lisa Smith into the life of this church? And do you renew your commitment with God's help to live before them in a kindly and Christian way, and to share with them the knowledge and love of Christ. Will you please reply with the words, we do. Let us pray. 
O God of love, we rejoice again to receive your grace in word and sacrament. We have heard your call and are made new by your Spirit. Guide and guard Antimo and Lisa all their days. May your love hold them, your truth guide them, your joy delight them. Since you have called them and you keep faith and will do it, make them holy through and through, free of any fault when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all those who are His own. O God of grace, in whose church there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, help us to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to profess with our whole lives the one true faith, and to live in love and unity with all who are baptized in His name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns and is worshipped and glorified with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Just before we have the certificates of baptism presented, I would like to point out our next, that our next hymn has been chosen by Antimo and Lisa. So, when we come to sing Amazing Grace, as we will in a moment or two, the hymn is their choice for this very special day in their lives.
I'll just wait a little bit while the children and young people go out to Sunday school. Looks like it's going to be a busy Sunday school this morning. So thank you for the parents for bringing them all here. The, now I have a few announcements today. The big one for um, most people with a finite for detail will have noticed that uh, when I checked the bulletin, I forgot to make sure that there was a, the announcement in for the fair. So I'll just go through a few things that uh, we need to sort of cover. So. <clears throat> Um, bring your used clothes, books, toys and white elephant things in early. It takes a while to price and arrange things, so pre please bring them in early and don't be um, that person who leaves it to Thursday or Friday, so particularly Friday. Please bring them in early during the week. Um, now we need people to bring their clothes racks up from downstairs. Um, Charles and Andrew, I think, did I see you here? Yep, if you could help and show some other people how to help please, that'd be appreciated. Um, and we also need some strong people to help put out the trestles and tables after people have had morning tea. So that's important to set it up. It makes it a lot easier to then for people to put their goods on there for the Saturday. We hope that we're going to have a nice um, sunny day like we have today. And Jenny will be in the hall to answer questions. Jenny, give a wave, please. The Jenny's down the back. And, uh, but she'll be in the hall afterwards. Now, I did get reminded that if you want to drop things off, there'll be someone in the hall um, Monday through Thursday, 9.30 to 2. So that's the important times. If you want to drop something off in the church, 9.30 to 2, Monday to Thursday. They even work on, um, on a public holiday. And there'll probably be someone there 9.30 to 2 on Friday as well, or 9.30 to 12 because they'll have everything finished. But, um, and I think that's all for the announcements. Thank you. This reading is from Numbers 21, verses four to nine. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to ground the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people so that many people of the is of the Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. The word of the Lord.
The New Testament reading comes from Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10, and you can find it on the back of your pew leaflet. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the most popular tourist attractions in Canberra is the National Gallery. The grounds that lie between the National Gallery and the shores of Lake Burley Griffin were configured into a garden to showcase 26 sculptures made by international and Australian artists. Most of the sculptures were brought and placed in the garden during the early 1980s and reflect the abstract industrial aesthetic of that time. However, there are some works that are more evocative, such as the fog sculpture and the Pukamani burial pools nearby. Anthony Gormley's life-sized maquette for Angel of the North which faces the lake, was a significant addition in 2010. Canberrans and tourists are impressed by the work of sculptures on display. A sculptor is someone who practices the art of sculpture. The word sculptor comes from a Latin word meaning to carve. A sculptor is a carver, an artist who carves and creates three-dimensional figures and objects out of solid substances such as stone, wood, clay, metal, and plastic. A sculptor must know how to use the various cutting tools for doing their work. For example, the pneumatic hammer, chisel, spike, and mallet. Sculptors must be able to shape a huge hard block of material smoothly and exactly. Some of the most famous sculptors include Michelangelo, Antonio Canova, Jeff Koons, Donatella. Two of the most famous female sculptors are 
Yayoi Kusama and Barbara Hepworth. When we see what gifted sculptors have done, we stand back in awe and wonder, and we ask, how did they do it? The greatest sculptor there has ever been is the great God of this universe. Michelangelo or any of the other famous sculptors I've just mentioned could never be compared to him. It is incredible that Almighty God possesses the skill to make something of outstanding beauty and quality out of ordinary material, which is our lives. Listen to what Paul has to say in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10a. For we are God's workmanship. The word that you have in front of you in your order of service sheet is handiwork. It means the same thing, but I'll use the word workmanship. For we are God's workmanship. I'm going to be daring enough to take the liberty of paraphrasing this text in my own words. We are pieces of sculpture made by God, the master sculptor. For we are God's workmanship. Paul's statement is one of the most positive, decisive, and glorious statements he ever made. Here we have one of Paul's great descriptions of what a Christian is. What are we as Christian people? Answer, we are God's workmanship. The ESV translation has, for we are His workmanship. The first and emphatic word in the sentence in the Greek word is the Greek word auto, translated His. Paul has already declared that salvation is not our achievement. Now he does not just state the opposite, namely that it is God's achievement. That's true, of course, but Paul goes much further. He tells us what we are now. We are God's workmanship, pieces of sculpture made by God, the greatest sculptor of all. The Greek noun for workmanship is poiema. It means his work of art, his masterpiece. This word, poema, speaks of creation. So far, Paul has described salvation in terms of a resurrection from the dead, a liberation from slavery, and a rescue from condemnation. You can read all about this earlier in his letter. Each description declares that the work is God's work, for dead people cannot bring themselves to life again, nor can captive and condemned people free themselves. But now Paul puts the matter beyond all doubt. Salvation is creation re-creation, new creation. 
creation language makes no sense unless there is a creator. The picture Paul has in mind here is of God as a master sculptor who undertakes a new divine act of creation in our ordinary lives. Being a Christian is not just about coming to Jesus and having a personal relationship with Him. That's essential, of course, but it's only but the beginning. Evangelism introduces people to the Christian faith. The response a person makes to the gospel invitation is only the first step. It is a long way from that point until the new Christian becomes the final product, or as we sometimes say, the finished article. The experience of becoming a Christian could be described as an entry into God's workshop. A new Christian is formed at that point when God starts to work on a rough piece of material called a human life. We are pieces of sculpture that God is working on every day. Paul is emphasizing here that Christianity is entirely the result of God's creativity. Sometimes we make the basic error of thinking that being a Christian is the result of what we have done. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I made Him, I made Him my Savior and Lord. The emphasis is on what we have done, my decision, my act. But nothing could be further from the truth. We sometimes act as if God is passive in all of this process. Though He is ready, of course, to respond to what we do or desire to do. God sees that I'm interested in becoming a Christian, so when He sees that I want to trust in His Son, then He responds and accepts me. That's not what Paul is saying here, and that is not the emphasis that we should be putting on. We respond to what God has done for us. That's the essence of Paul's teaching in his letter to the Ephesians. Paul's image here helps us to see God working in His cluttered workshop, which is a hive of activity. God's hands, those special unique hands of God, they are constantly at work, carving, shaping, and fashioning us to produce something of outstanding beauty, quality, and value. The work is completely God's responsibility. Paul states emphatically that God is the master sculptor who is working every day on the rough material of our lives with His hammer and chisel and all the other tools at His disposal, metaphorically speaking. What a task he has. He never takes a break. He never goes on holiday. There's no public holiday on God's calendar. Working on our lives 
as a full-time job. Producing Christians is one thing. Perfecting them is quite another. God often takes a long time to work on us in His workshop. But day after day after day, He, he carves, He shapes, and He fashions us according to His perfect design. For we are God's handiwork, His workmanship. We are pieces of sculpture made by God, the master sculptor. And here's something I want you to notice. There are no rejects in God's workshop. There are no failures in the end. God never loses patience with us. We are hard work. God has His work cut out when He's working on our lives. But His work is always perfect. It is complete in spite of our waywardness and our imperfection. Just think, if it depended on us, the pieces of sculpture, the pieces of sculpture that we produce from our lives would be of very poor quality. Just imagine what they would look like. Well, they would be a hideous sight. We would be embarrassed to put them on display for people to view. Paul isn't finished. He goes on in verse 10b, God wants to prepare us for good works, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. When God looked down upon you and loved you and began to work in you to make you a Christian. He had already prepared the works which you should carry out. While earlier on I said that all of this is God's responsibility, not ours. That is true. But it's also true to say that we do not remain passive and inert in all of this. There is no such thing as faith without good works. The proof of faith is good works. The essential quality of the Christian life is good works. Listen to what John Stott has to say about this. Good works are indispensable to salvation, not as its ground or means, however, but as its consequence and evidence. God is making us for a special and unique purpose. His work isn't finished yet. In the case of some of us, He still has a lot of work to do. And let me be honest about myself. God certainly has a lot of work to do in my life. I am very far from being the finished article. I am conscious of God's work in my life every day. But one day, God will complete the task. 
I like to use my imagination at this point. It might be a little stretch, but I hope you get the point. In heaven, God will have an exhibition of His sculptures. All His finished, perfect pieces of sculpture, that is to say, your lives and my life, will be on display at the art gallery in heaven. It will make impressive viewing. Perhaps you've tried to make something of value out of your life through your own work. You've tried this, and you've tried that, and you've, you, you've made New Year resolutions, and you've tried all sorts of things to reform your life and improve it, but you have failed miserably despite your best efforts. Your Christian life is, to put it mildly, a complete mess. It's like that sentence I used at the beginning of the service when we were assuring ourselves of God's pardon. We could be described as a heap of rubble. It's not an impressive sight. You try to hide the real state of your life from other people. You don't possess the creativity or the skill to make something of good quality out of your life. Well then, why not admit that you've failed? So allow God, even this very day, to take you into His workshop and to start working on your life so that one day the finished article of your Christian life will be, wait for it, perfect. For we are God's workmanship. Our text has particular relevance, I believe, for Antimo and Lisa, who were baptized earlier in this service. I indicated at the beginning of their baptism that I would come back and say a few words to them. I'm now going to do that. A number of weeks ago, Antimo and Lisa came to see me to discuss their journey of faith. Each of them, in turn, told me their story. It was clear to me as I listened to them that God had begun a work in each of their lives. To demonstrate this, they asked me if I would baptize them before this congregation. I informed them that it would be a great pleasure and privilege to do so. Both Antimo and Lisa desired to publicly profess their faith in Jesus Christ and to pledge their willingness to allow God to continue His work in their lives into the future. Neither Antimo or Lisa is the finished article as the result of their baptism today. What took place here in church a short while ago was just a milestone along their journey of faith. For them, there is a long way to go. And I want to say to both of them this morning, I believe with all my heart that God has so much that He wants to do in your lives. The work is only in its early stages. But one day, 
the work of God, the master sculptor, will be complete. And Ansimo and Lisa will be perfect. The story is told of a college principal who retired after a long and distinguished career. A portrait of him was unveiled at the college where he had served. In expressing his thanks and appreciation, he paid a well-deserved compliment to the artist. The retired principal said that in future years, he believed people viewing the portrait would not ask, who is that man? But rather, who painted that portrait? May the sculpture exhibits of our lives draw the attention of people not to us, but to the skill of God, the master sculptor. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Merciful God, you have richly blessed our lives with love and bounty beyond measure. Bless these gifts we return to you now, that they may bestow the same richness of your love and grace in the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Loving God, remind us of your grace and mercy. Reveal your goodness through every situation that we encounter this week. Enable us to see life where others had declared death. Remind us that your salvation is a gift. We cannot earn it. We cannot possess it. You give it to us, and you sustain us in it. You are the master sculptor, and you work every day in our lives to perfect us until we are the finished article. We thank you, O God, in the mighty name of the crucified Christ. We give you thanks, O God, that you gather your people from north and south, from east and west, and so now we ask that you will hear our prayers for all the peoples of the world. We pray for all who are the victims of hatred, oppression, or war, thinking particularly of those in Israel, Gaza, and Ukraine. We pray for the one holy universal church. We pray for all church leaders and ministers and for all who are involved in the administration of the church. We also pray for all missionaries serving in their home countries and overseas. We pray that as the gospel is preached, many will experience the fullness of life. We pray for those who are excluded, undervalued, or forgotten in our society. We pray for all who are living without purpose or hope, for all who struggle with addictions, for the friendless and those who mourn, for the sick and the dying. We pray for those in our congregations who are ill or are recovering from recent illness or surgery. Joan Berry, Helen Green, Josie Brand, and Heather Barry. Lay your healing touch upon each one of them. We pray for our St. Andrew's Church Fair next Saturday. For Jenny Liu, the convener of the fair committee, and all the volunteers who will help her look after the stalls, and do other tasks that are very much part of our fair. We pray that this event will be a great time for our members and visitors to enjoy being together, and that the fair will generate funds to support the work of our pastoral charge. We give you thanks, O God, that in Christ you bring your people from death to everlasting life. 
We remember all those who have died in your love. We think of those who, in our own congregation, marking the anniversary of the loss of loved ones at this time of year. Comfort them with the fragrant memories of the past and help them and all of us to look on you and believe, knowing that we, with all your saints, will experience the joy of eternal life. Hear our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God continue His creative work in our lives so that we will carry out good works according to His perfect design. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all throughout the season of Lent and until the work 
of perfecting our lives is complete. Thank you.